Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on the, the shipwrecks and salvage option of the HSC chemistry syllabus. And in the previous lessons we've sort of done a recap of electrolytes, redox reactions, and you know some historical stuff about redox reactions. So now we're going to start looking at actually the chemistry of ships, and in particular we're going to be looking at ships and alloys, okay? And why certain materials are picked in favor of other materials. So ships and alloys. Obviously here we have a very large ship cruise liner and the choice of material that goes into it is very important. Similarly, you know, in a jet engine you need a certain material. Um, it has to be strong but it has to be light. It has to be very heat resistant um, but it shouldn't be too brittle either. So there's all sorts of different considerations. Um, that you need to do. And particularly for marine environments, you need to be a little bit more aware because the salt water can eat through certain materials pretty quickly. So, um, ships in general. Um, for those who are actually very you know, nautically minded, I'm going to use ships, the word ships, as any sort of marine object that floats in the water because I don't really know the difference. Um, until the advent of iron, basically. So until we could refine iron very well, Wood was the shipbuilding material. Okay? We would just build everything out of wood. Now once we developed iron refining processes, um, we took iron as a, better, uh, as a better building material than wood because it's stronger. Uh, you can build things, you could build a smaller amount, you could use a smaller amount of iron and so it could be lighter. Um, and you could also, uh, you know, it would take less sort of working in order to get it to, to a ship shape. So as we continued to develop our understanding of metallurgy, we replaced iron with steel. Now again, steel is better in the sense that it's corrosion resistant, or more so, and it tended to survive a bit longer than the iron um, in the harsh sea environments. So then the question is, what is corrosion? Well, corrosion is a redox reaction which damages or degrades metal objects. As you can see here, all the little black and uh, like speckly spots are uh, corrosion sites, and they damage them because you know they they reduce the mechanical properties of these metals. So eventually, this degradation will lead to the, the metal being unsuitable for whatever use it is. Um, so if you imagine like a bolt that's holding up something, you don't want it to rust through; otherwise, that bolt's going to fall off, and then it's no longer going to be able to do its job. So most corrosion that we see, most, so not all, most, is caused by the presence of oxygen. So we have oxygen around, it reacts with things, and causes corrosion. Um, corrosion applies to all metals. Um, so any metal that experiences corrosion, or experiences a reaction with oxygen, uh, we call it corrosion. But for iron, we call that rusting. So there's just the very subtle difference. Uh, we call rust rusting only applies to iron, corrosion applies to everything. So the presence of water can also accelerate the corrosion process. So for instance, if you had a car and you just left that in the desert, very dry air, there's plenty of oxygen, just very dry air. It won't corrode as quickly as something some as if you left that car in, say, you know, a river or something where there's plenty of water and oxygen as well. So you can see from a logic perspective that would happen. From experience side, you can see that, that water can definitely accelerate the corrosion process. So to avoid corrosion, we have lots of other things. Or as a sort of side note to corrosion, we have passivation. So if you think about aluminium from a chemical perspective, it's got a much higher reactivity than iron. So if you look at the table, the reduction table, you'll see that aluminium is much higher than iron. Yet, aluminium often exists much, exhibits sorry, much less reactivity. So, you know, your soft drink comes in an aluminium can, and that soft drink is quite acidic, yet the can doesn't dissolve. But, if you made an iron can, and then you put soft drink in it, it would probably corrode pretty rapidly. So the question becomes, well, why is this happening? There must be a reason why aluminium, even though it's more reactive than iron, it doesn't experience this level of corrosion from soft drink. 
So the reason is passivation. Okay? So passivation is when you have a chemically inert film that forms on the surface of the metal due to a reaction with oxygen or water. So in aluminium's case, you form aluminium oxide on the surface. And that adheres to, so it sticks to the aluminium metal very, very strongly, and it forms an impervious layer to stop more oxygen getting into the, um, the rest of the aluminium. So in essence, the corrosion, so to speak, the reaction with oxygen, actually helps to keep the aluminium from reacting after you know, the first portion. Okay? And so passivation is that process. So it, uh, it reacts with oxygen, forms a very thin layer of aluminium oxide, and that aluminium oxide is super unreactive and doesn't want to react with anything. And so it protects the inside aluminium from further corrosion. So for aluminium, you've got four aluminium atoms plus three oxygen uh, molecules gives you two Al2O3, which is aluminium oxide. And this protects the inner layer from corrosion. So other metals that do this are tungsten. So remember when we had those old style light bulbs where that got really hot? Tungsten was the little really hot part. And that forms a passivation layer. And chromium, which is uh, basically the element that helps to make chrome and chrome steel and stainless steel, also forms a passivation layer as well. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on alloys and chips. So we've looked at what an alloy is and the, the usage of metals in ships. And we've also looked at corrosion, passivation, and what they are, and how they affect our material of choice. Okay. So, question one. Identify properties of steel which make it suitable for a ship's hulls. So what properties of steel make it very good for ships? It's strong. That's the main one. It's very hard. Um, but while it's very hard, it's also malleable. So we can form it into different shapes. And so, and another, so by being able to make it into different shapes, we can make it into plates so, and then weld them together. So having that ability to shape the metal is very good. And steel is less dense than iron and can be made very corrosion resistant, assuming we use the right elements. Okay? So if we alloy the steel really well, we can get a very corrosion resistant, very strong um, me uh, metal and that can be used very effectively in ships. So a student placed iron into HCl and noticed a vigorous reaction. So I'm sure you've done this in your lab at some point in your life. The student tried the same experiment with a piece of aluminium, which had been left out overnight and noticed nothing. Explain why, this is, why there is no reaction, even though the reactivity of aluminium is much higher than iron. So aluminium is a passivating metal, as I just mentioned at the end and forms a very strong layer of aluminium oxide. So when it was left out overnight, that piece of aluminium, it reacted with the oxygen in the air to form this aluminium oxide layer. Now that layer is chemically inactive and protected the inner aluminium from, um, from the attack of the HCl. And so you didn't notice any reaction because the HCl just couldn't get out any of the aluminium atoms. So that's why, passivation. So outline a situation in which the passivating properties of a metal would be lost. So let's say we had a passivating metal, but we had a situation where, are there any situations where we could actually lose that, that, um, that protective property? So if the damage to the passivating layer occurs when there is no oxygen available, the metal will not be able to repair the layer. So let's say we took a piece of aluminium and accidentally hit it with something. Um, the passivating layer may have come off but there's no oxygen, so it can't repair that because the oxygen can't react with the, the next layer of aluminium. And the protection will be lost. So this can happen in an underground pipeline, for instance. Now, then the question is, well, if there's no oxygen, what's it going to react with? Because you know, there's, no, there's not going to be any corrosion either. Well, as we'll learn later, a lack of oxygen doesn't necessarily mean a lack of corrosion. We'll learn that there are other chemicals that can cause corrosion um, that aren't oxygen. So if we damage a passivating layer, like mechanically, through like a, a strike or something, 
then there's no oxygen available, it can't repair that layer. So other chemicals that may react more vigorously with this aluminium may react and cause corrosion. Okay. And explain why corrosion is accelerated in the presence of water. So while we know this happens, can we actually explain why does it happen? So when the metal reacts with oxygen, sometimes you form insoluble compounds, right? So let's say sodium. Sodium reacts with, say, oxygen, and we could form sodium hydroxide. Uh, well, actually, sodium oxide, which will then become sodium hydroxide, which is soluble in water. Now, if these chem compounds remain on the surface, they can protect it from further oxidation. So if that sodium oxide sat on the outside of the sodium chunk, then it could protect the inner sodium from, from oxygen. So it could stop the oxygen from getting to that inner sodium. However, in the presence of water, these soluble compounds are dissolved and thus no longer protect the metal. So the water can actually sweep away all this uh, sodium compound, or all these uh, oxygen compounds, take them away, then the oxygen can continue to attack the metal. And that's why so having water around is so damaging in terms of corrosion um, compared to just having oxygen. So the constant removal of surface chemicals increases the corrosion rate. Okay. Question five. Train tracks are made of steel and are often covered in rust. Explain why this is not a big safety concern. So for those who catch train, I catch train all the time. I sometimes look out and see other tracks. So as I go past, I see the other tracks laid down on the ground. And if you look at them, only the very top layer is clean. It's very shiny, whereas the other parts are all rusty. Um, now the question is, should we be concerned that there's so much rust? Um, because we know that corrosion uh, affects the mechanical properties and thus the safety of these um, train tracks. So they're obviously designed for a certain level of corrosion. Okay, So that's the first thing. Now since the rust covers the track, it also protects that track from additional corrosion. So it's on the outside. So the oxygen can't continue to attack it because it's just being stopped by this outside rust. Now, if the rust was constantly removed and more rust was allowed to form, then that might be an issue for safety because then your metal would slowly get smaller and smaller. So it's not a big concern, um, but that's why they have to sometimes replace tracks because the top layer is constantly being worn away. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on alloys and chips. So we looked at you know, ships and the building materials of ships and corrosion as well as passivation in terms of how that affects our material choice. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.